So dear mainly brothers and sisters, uh, so any of the sisters that are here are feeling very outnumbered, which is great, isn't it? <laughs> it's great to hear that rumble of low male voices and all the, during the, the responses from us. Uh, so have you ever seen those artists, um, usually in maybe cities uh, abroad, where they use chalk? And the things that they can do with chalk is quite incredible, where I've seen a couple do kind of 3D drawings on the pavement. So they make it look like the pavement is cracked, and you can see into like another world on the far side of the, you know, there's, a, there's like a crack, and then there's a bit of a cave, and then on the far side you see La La Land, or Wonderland, or Disneyland, or something, I don't know. But, but they're able to do that with chalk. Have you ever tried to do something artistic with chalk? I've no idea how they do it. I have with a box of chalk, whatever, 10 colours of chalk, how they can make something that looks real, that looks like a hole that leads into another world, right? And like, what's tragic is, they do these amazing works of art, or maybe they combine kind of modern stuff and, and retro stuff where you have the kind of the uh, God touching Adam's finger and sparks coming out of it or something, and they make it look so real. But it's chalk, it's effectively dust. How long is it going to last? until the next shower, which in Ireland means 15 minutes. <laughs> right. So this, 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 like, this capo lavoro, like this, this absolute masterpiece, will last maybe a day before it just gets walked over by tourists. And it's done with chalk, something that all of your kids play with or eat or uh, draw on each other, draw on the walls. It's done with chalk. But what's the, what's the difference? Like, what's the key element here? It's not just, it's not the chalk. <laughs> it's not the chalk. It's the artist. It's the person who has the eye and the combination of colours and depth and shading and, and the vision to kind of put together the image in the first place. It's the, the artist who can do something amazing with something so incredibly ordinary. Chalk couldn't be more ordinary. It's coloured dust squished into a little cylinder. And yet they can, uh, the artist can do something absolutely fantastic. The saints of today are saints Peter and Paul. And what's absolutely wonderful is that scripture does not hold back at telling us how useless these two fellows were and how often they messed up. Like it's, it's, the, the gospel, especially when it comes to Peter, the gospels do not shy away from telling us how often Peter got it wrong. They should have. It really would have been a better idea, in my humble opinion, to leave out all the mistakes that Peter made. Surely, if he's going to be the first pope, you want to make him look good, no? You want to, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the leader of the party. If you're part of Fine Gael and, you know, the party leader, no matter what he says, has to be right. You know, you have to toe the party line, and whatever he says wrong, just blame Fianna Fáil. <laughs> but whatever you do, you protect your party leader. Surely that's what the gospel writers should have done, the evangelists. No! They don't. They have no trouble pointing out when St. Peter got it wrong. And he got it wrong on a number of occasions. One of the most striking, or one of the most maybe beautiful for, for our reflection for, for this weekend, is after the miraculous catch of fish. During the day, which the, the apostles, or well, the fishermen at the time knew you don't, you don't fish during the day. Apparently, the fish come to closer to the surface at night, where when the bugs and mosquitoes and all those things are out so they can just eat them. That's what they do, I guess. So basically, the fishermen in, in, in Galilee knew that you fish, at, you fish at night. You fish at night. You don't fish during the day. So Jesus calls out to them, have you caught anything? And he said, they say, nothing. Nothing at all. He says, cast out the nets. And you can imagine, it's like, as a fisherman, you're like, no, no. You don't fish during the day. Like someone telling you, plant a cabbage upside down. No, they don't grow that way. But Jesus asked for it, so okay. They cast out the nets, they're trying to haul them in, nearly sinks their boat, nearly sinks the other boat. They have to call in the other boat for help. And then Peter drops to his knees and says, leave me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I can't be associated with these miracles and all of your obvious goodness and holiness. Like, I, that's, not, that's not me. 
And what's Jesus' reaction? Does he say, you're right, you're a bit of a, bit of a mess? No. He says, from now on, I'll make you fishers of men. You're not perfect, but stick with me. I will make you a fisher of men. He's not saying, I'm sending you out on your own to be a fisher of men. I will make you a fisher of men. We stay united with the Lord, and we can do incredible things. St. Paul will later write, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. This is like the key point which for, for us men I think we find, we find difficult. We, find, we try to resolve things ourselves. We try to be autonomous. We try to fix things. We like fixing things. But then often you just come to this point where I just, I can't fix it. I just, I'm not, a, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix this. And then that, that burden, that weight just starts to drag us down because it's, we feel it's on us to get the, all these things right and get the family right and get the finances right and get the, the health of our children and the, their futures, get all this right. And yet, who are you? I'm a farmer. Or I'm a block layer. I don't know anything about world economics or my children's health. I can't fix that. And you begin to feel so small, so insignificant. That self-reliance is disastrous for us. Because we can't fix things. There are some things we can. But a lot of the big things we can't. So the Lord is asking us to count on him. We'll be reflecting on that later on today. Simon Peter, like, I mean, so he recognizes his own sinfulness and says, Lord, I don't think you really want to work with me. That's not really, that's not going to work out. Like, there are plenty of men who are better educated, uh, maybe multilingual. It's, the chances are St. Peter probably couldn't read or write. It would have been quite, quite rare for, for, for people to have been able to, if, as a fisherman, like, unlikely. You know, when you've got all these scribes and Pharisees and educated people and all the Romans, just to choose some of them. Surely they know the, the lie of the land and the run of things better than me. St. Paul, then a little later on, when they were stoning St. Stephen, they drag him out of the city. They stone him to death. And then they put their cloaks down at the feet of a young man named Saul, St. Paul, who entirely approved of the killing. Approved of a killing. Approved of a stoning to death of a man. There is Paul, happy out. Now, you can imagine when on the road to Damascus then St. Paul has his conversion. Who would actually have believed he converted? It's like, you know, Oliver Cromwell closes out down all these monasteries and dispossesses the, the Catholics and so on and so forth. And then, then he's, oh, he's supposed to come to, to Dungarvan. Apparently he is converted. Right. I won't be seen anywhere near him. Right. Apparently he has converted. I believe it when I see it. Like St. Paul dragged people away in chains to prisons, and prisons of the, of the time were not the relatively luxurious places they are now. So St. Paul has his conversion, goes to a city, no one wants anything to do with him, <laughs> apart from a few Christians. Ananias then uh, heals his blindness, and off he goes to become one of the most influential characters in the church, in the history of the church. So what's the point? The point is, when we look at ourselves, we're not perfect and we're, we're kind of, we're a work in progress. We're, we're incomplete. We're not finished. And yet, a lot has been entrusted to us. For those of you who are married, for those of you who, are children, who have children, for those who are even just young men of faith in, in this world, a lot has been entrusted to you. And I think it's only a matter of time, if it hasn't happened already, that you're going to feel fairly unable or just maybe painfully aware of your own limitedness, your own inability. And often, as we'll be seeing this later on today, we hide that. We, we hide that. We hide those parts of us that are insecure. We hide those parts of us that don't know. We hide those parts of us that we don't want anyone to see, 
that make us look weak. And we present this facade of confidence and ability when behind it there can be all sorts of hurt. I think often in traditional Irish families, you know, you can think back in the 50s, 60s, um, mass attendance would have been good, maybe even daily, mass, daily rosary in the, in the home would have been good. But how did men deal with loss or with pain or with rejection or with the bullying of their childhood or with the absence of their father or the alcoholism of their father? How did men deal with these things? They didn't. Or they would just drink it down. And what were the consequences of that? Absolutely horrific. So we need a better solution. <clears throat> the solution isn't to look at the needs of our families and look at our own brokenness and say, this is impossible, I'm done. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm burying this. I'm, I'm, I'm drinking it all down because this, this, nothing can be done here. I can't fix this, I'm done. That's not a solution. It's not a solution that's going to work. It's not a solution that's going to bring any healing. How about we recognize the Lord's call, the Lord's grace, what the Lord has, has given, what the Lord has actually entrusted to us. But with that, keep in mind always, he never asked us to do it alone. He never asked us to do this on our own. That was never the goal. That was never the, the, the homework, if you will. He never asked us to do this alone. Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. I will be with you always, yes, till the end of time. Go make disciples of all nations, but I will be with you. This might be a new concept or a new departure for many of us. It's something, to be honest, that I became aware of a couple of years ago that I, I have to continuously renew and deepen myself. Reliance on God, not self-reliance. And this is something that our, our saints of today were, were very aware of, and they did live it. They, made, they had their failures, but now we celebrate them as great saints and pillars of the church. So we ask the Lord today to renew our hearts, our hearts as men, our hearts as fathers, brothers, sons, and to teach us to live in that confidence that we're never alone, and that whatever, Lord, you have asked us to do, you make us capable of. Amen.